Welcome to the second half of Funny About That, coming to you live from the Indie Fringe building at the used to be edge of, now middle of Mass Ave. We are still trying to buy this building, and we are about 30K shy, and we have until December 30th. So once again, I am locking the doors and <laughs> turning you all upside down by your ankles. Thank you so much for coming. And that first half of the, sh first half of the show, first half of the show, I was riveted. We, uh, we talked a little smack about Santa Claus for the first 40 minutes of the show, and I just want to point out, before I again go on another Christmas-related tirade, that I like Santa Claus. I used to for many years not to, but he has one redeeming quality that overshadows all of the other potentially negative ones, okay? Santa Claus gives parents the ability to give a gift to their child unfettered, freely, with no strings attached, to just purely give something to a child with no involvement from them whatsoever except the simple joy of standing back and watching happiness spread across the face of a child who has just experienced magic, true magic, Real magic, sorry Taylor, real magic. <laughs> <laughs> and I am as big a fan of shoving reality into people's faces and making them swallow it as the next guy, but that is not something that I want to take away from people. And another reason that Santa Claus is an attractive choice for modern parents today is that he serves as a really great stepping stone towards the belief that there is a larger being out there who knows everything you do. And you know, the kid you know, turns however old that they do and realizes that it's bogus and you go, okay, you caught me. Santa isn't real, you're a smart kid, but you're a grown up now. So I'm gonna tell you the truth. There's an even bigger guy with an even whiter beard who lives much farther north. And he doesn't just know what you're doing. He's inside you right now. <laughs> when I was six years old, we lived in a big house in the island nation of Indonesia, and before moving there, we'd always celebrated Christmas, so I thought we still would. It didn't really matter to me that we were living in a Muslim country surrounded by mosques and ritual buffalo slaughter on the weekends. My big concern was that our house had no chimney. How was he going to get in? Craftily, I built a chimney out of construction paper and taped it to the wall. It worked. <laughs> Six-year-old Phil was just as proud as you are. After a year, I had seen and experienced a lot for a seven-year-old, and I had my little skeptics slash I really still want to believe hat on, the kind that only a seven-year-old can wear, and I devised an infallible plan to determine the true identity of Santa Claus. On Christmas Eve, after my parents went to bed, I snuck down the hallway, stood in front of their closed bedroom door, plucked a single hair, from the top of my head and carefully scotch taped it to the door and the door frame. If that hair was broken in the morning, Santa would be dead to me forever. <laughs> well, most Christmas days I wake up giddy for presents. That year I woke up and gritted my teeth for truth, marched down the hallway. The hair was not broken, it was missing. And so was the tape. I confronted my father. I know Santa isn't real. What? He cried in what might have been genuine astonishment. Why? I told him about the hair. That was you? I got up in the middle of the night for water. I saw it and I took it down. I'm sorry. Of course! I had taped it up as high as I could reach, presuming that would be out of sight. But no, it was right at eye level for this giant person. Of course he had seen it and taken it down. Santa survived another season. <laughs> and the next year, I didn't pull any hair out of my head. So, as you guys are all probably aware, it's that time of year again. 
Only 11 more days until the anniversary of the signing of the Constitution of the Republic of China. <laughs> yes. Has it been a hundred years already? Right, so Christmas. Um, I tend to notice that a lot of people are very sad this time of year, but to be fair, that might have a lot to do with me. I tend to notice that people around me are sad in the same way that a really drunk person at a party thinks everyone else around them must also be really drunk. <laughs> but it's truly not me. There are, it's not just me. There, there are enough clinical studies at this point to prove that when the temperature starts to drop and the days start getting shorter, people's rhythms get all out of sorts and then they follow suit. Now, in 1984, this condition acquired a medical term and since then has been known as seasonal affective disorder. I believe before then it was known as uh, the winter blues or uh, the fuck you, it's cold outside reality of human nature. Um, and for a while, I thought I had sad. I thought I had seasonal depression for many years, but this could not be true because personal studies revealed by the time January rolled around, I felt pretty good. By New Year's, I was feeling positively neutral about things. So what was really my problem? Is a popular subject of conversation around the house. Well, I, I got my answer. I got my answer just this year, you guys. And I'm really excited to kind of share with you and see if maybe I'm not alone in this. Because just this year, I figured out what upsets me so much this time of year. And I, I found out in my car, driving to work, I passed this house, great house, huge number of inflatable and animatronic things in the yard. They had a, an inflatable carousel with elves riding reindeer that was like 20 feet in diameter. It was huge. They had a life-size uh, snow globe with the whole Peanuts gang in it with snow blowing around it. The Grinch was landing a biplane on the roof repeatedly over and over again. S little Christmas light deer were constantly being surprised by something and then assured that everything, everything's fine. Wait, what? what? Oh, no, it's cool. It's cool. <laughs> and there was, a, there was a manger scene, and the manger scene was, it was this plastic, light-up, individual character manger scene. Baby Jesus on full display, lit up by this 200-watt outdoor floodlight, both to remind the viewer he is the light of God and for safety. Junior high kids love to steal them some Jesus this time of year. <laughs> and directly adjacent to the, the manger scene was this giant blow-up Santa riding this double giant blow-up sleigh, poised as if he were about to crash through the manger scene. Like we were witnessing the photo right before he vehicularly saint slaughtered gods, virgins, and kings indiscriminately. And in a, I took this all in in a flash, you know, the whole scene. And I realized this is, this is what bothers me about the season. You've got your hollow, empty, plastic symbolism being run over by this inflated and insincere mandate to consume, masquerading as a morality lesson for children who really should just be the face of type 2 diabetes. And as this is all occurring to me, the reporter on the car radio announced that shopping season is in full swing, and I had my answer. I am not depressed during the winter. I am not depressed during the holidays. I am depressed during shopping season. <laughs> formerly known as the holidays, formerly known as Christmas, formerly known as winter solstice, etc. And the term just what it to say that shopping season makes me uncomfortable would be like saying Fecal transplants make me uncomfortable. <laughs> True, they do, but it doesn't quite capture the nuances of what's going on in my mind during this time of year. I think the term shopping season is a straight up Old Testament biblical abomination. I mean, first off, you've got the whole thou shalt have no gods before me and the whole idolatry routine. And I don't particularly subscribe to any patriarchal monotheism over another, but I am under the distinct impression that seasons are God's department. Okay? Humanity has no business creating seasons willy-nilly on their own whenever it suits their economical schedule. 
shopping season is unnatural. Like blue M&Ms. <laughs> or Rick Perry with his mouth open. <laughs> Rick Perry with his mouth closed. Good looking guy, you know, he's all right. Rick Perry with his mouth open, ooh, mm, abomination. Every time I hear the phrase shopping season, after I do my little like epilepsy dance, it, I get the distinct impression that some huge and incomprehensible thing has just opened season on me. And that I am being shot at from every radio, TV, and storefront I go by. Even, it never ends, it never ends. Like I went into a JCPenney to buy these pants. And for 45 minutes while I was in there, they had a loop advertisement inside the JCPenney's for the JCPenney. Please shop at JCPenney. You guys, this is getting a little awkward and desperate. This is like, I'm here already. I am in the store shopping. Please stop selling me on the idea that I should be in here because I am right now. It's like going on a first date and they, they're constantly asking you out. Like, wh why are you doing this? This is happening. Like, if we were married, maybe sometimes like a renewal of vows, you propose to your spouse again, that could be romantic. But JCPenney and I are not on that level. Christmas is one day a year. It's one day, one day out of the year. And I am sure that we have all watched with varying degrees of awe and horror as it has marched over the last few years steadily back through December, crashed past Thanksgiving, marched its way through to the beginning of November, and now the advance of Christmas is being held bravely at bay by the witches and warlocks of Halloween. <laughs> and these brave creatures are holding back the flood of Yuletide like some kind of bizarre, secular, a paganistic cultural dyke, but no matter how strong, it invariably bursts annually at about midnight on October 31st and sends a surging torrent of half-off candy and the, the ceremonial ringing of Pavlov's Christmas bells all over the porch of November. Those bells change people. Car horns that have gone unused for 10 months are suddenly silent no more. Children, who are normally well-behaved, begin to warm up their entitlement screams, <laughs> which may be heard from Castleton Mall to Carmel, <laughs> ringing about the imaginary hills of Fishers. <laughs> and if you've... Did I just stumble into a thing that I don't know? Because I just made that up. Carmel and Fishers, they're like the wannabe AAA team for Beverly Hills. They're trying so hard, they really are. If you've ever wondered why other cultures don't respect American culture as much as they ought, perhaps you could find an answer to that question in a video clip, as Abdul mentioned, of people macing each other at the mall over video games, or people out celebrating the Christmas spirit by fist fighting each other over $2 waffle irons at Walmart. And it is because of this kind of attitude that I dropped out of Christmas. In my 20s. <laughs> All right, uh, it was a failed experiment and I'll tell you why. I told my parents and my family and my friends that I wasn't getting them anything and that my gift to them was that they didn't have to get anything for me. <laughs> which was the gift I secretly wanted. It was like I tried to force them to preemptively re-gift the gift of not giving. And it just confused everyone. They got me presents anyway. I didn't get them anything and just felt too embarrassed about the whole thing to even send thank you cards. So I was talking to Noel about what my real problem with the season is. Noel being my girlfriend, not the spirit of Christmas. It's uh, <laughs> not, like not having a Dickensian dream sequence or anything. And I told her something like, you know, I, I feel this obligation to buy things for people, and there are so many people I want to buy things for that I just get overwhelmed, and I, I wind up just not getting anything for anyone and feeling terrible about the whole thing. And she said, no, hold on. Is what you're telling me that you don't like Christmas 
because you have too many friends. And I said, yes, that is it. That is my problem. And she gave me that look of sort of baffled and loosely horrified, unconditional love <laughs> that told me I had been correct to not bring this subject up on our first date. <laughs> that really was it. I mean, I feel this obligation to participate in things. And during the winter, I just want to hibernate. I don't want to do anything. Like, during the, during the year, I'm a pretty social guy. I have a pretty positive attitude. Show me a baby. I'll smile at it. That's fine. <laughs> then December 1st rolls around. I'm angry at babies for no reason. <laughs> I go to bed at 8 p.m. because I'm ashamed of myself for being so mad at babies for no reason. And I find myself making these specific trips to the grocery store and defiantly only buying ice cream and cookie dough despite the fact that I have nothing in the refrigerator or pantry. And one, one, one year, I was so tired that before bed, I convinced myself that the brownie I had just eaten was, was the same thing as brushing my teeth. <laughs> and on top of all this, I have to go to work? No, 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 now you're pushing it. The only job I want this time of year is a uh, pillow adjuster. <laughs> or like maybe if I'm feeling really frisky, chocolate double boiler. I mean, I wanna go to, I want to go to bed with a book and some food nearby, and I want to wake up with the same situation going on. I mean, the only thing I want to achieve during the day to feel good about myself is a slightly raised sitting position so I, <laughs> so I don't spill too much food up my nose, <laughs> which is a stiff learning curve from last year. Winter is the time when I want to actively participate in feeling bad for myself. I want to wallow around in the deepest parts of my wildest apathies, push social contact away so that I can dig in to the hard, lonely work of pitching myself against myself and turning over the psychic topsoils of my mind and really taking a nice, concentrated, rejuvenative, fertilizing dump just right in there and getting all that shit to spread out and absorb itself throughout the entirety of my being so that I can get over it and be ready for next year and a whole nother round of build up and unexpected growth. But that is not allowed. Heaven forbid that I should recharge myself in the winter. Hibernating is not allowed during the winter. Do you have any idea? And maybe you do. I didn't mean to be angry. How many festivals there are between the month of November and February? Hanukkah, Ramadan, if you celebrate the winter calendar, Boxing Day, Thanksgiving, Martin Luther King Day, New Year's, New Year's Eve, Chinese New Year's, Festivus, I said that one, Kwanzaa, Groundhog's Day, and Christmas. Advent, All Saints Day, Christmas Eve, the 12 days of Christmas, St. Nicholas's Day, Veterans Day, St. Stephen's Day, St. John the Evangelist's Day, Holy Innocence Day, Watch Night, or Wach Night, St. Basil's Day, the Super Bowl, Epiphany, Twelfth Night, Eastern Orthodox Christmas, Armenian Apostolic Christmas, Candlemas, Feast of the Circumcision, and of course the most terrifying winter holiday of them all, aside from Krampus, St. Valentine's Day, where shit can really go wrong. <laughs> Jesus. Purim, Tu Bishvat, Bodhisattva Day, Celtic Winter Solstice, Saxon Winter Solstice, Germanic Winter Solstice, Persian Winter Solstice, Roman Winter Solstice, or for you purists, Modernect, Yule, Yalda, and Saturnalia, respectively. Diwali, Panchaganepti, Samhain, or Shavna, for you modern folks. Imbolch, Sade, Arab Spring, Chahar Shambasuri, Lupercalia, Kolenda, and my personal favorite, Malanka, a Ukrainian festival celebrating the end of the holidays.
Now, a lot of those things that I mentioned uh, predate the Old Testament, and some of them are very new, like Kwanzaa and Festivus, which are not quite 50 years old. Incidentally, they were both, this point of interest, Kwanzaa and Festivus, both invented in 1966, feel free to fact check me, by people who felt like they needed an alternative to the religious mainstream offerings. Now, some of the things that I mentioned aren't really celebrated popularly anymore, like the Feast of the Circumcision. And you know what? I think that's okay. <laughs> just, just because I think someone finally realized that making people say the word feast and circumcision in the same sentence was, it doesn't come willingly out of the mouth. And really, you know, there's just so much awkwardness around, like, what do you serve for dinner at the Feast of the Circumcision party? I've always gone with calamari rings and rib tips, but <laughs> I'd, actually, I'd actually never heard of the Feast of the Circumcision, and I did find it a bit odd that some people chose to celebrate the cutting off of a small piece of their Immaculate Lord's ding-dang, but it is not the most bizarre thing to happen this time of year. I mean, every culture has its own odd traditions that have sprung up around Christmas and the Christmas tradition. Like in America, we've got our, if you're good, you get presents, if you're bad, you get some fossil fuels, and that is very American. <laughs> Other countries, like uh, in Holland, if you're bad, uh, Sinterklaas's assistant, Zwart Piet, will put you in a burlap sack and take you back to Spain on the steamboat to make soap out of you. <laughs> there are some alpine countries that have a Christmas witch named Perkta, and if you're bad, she will slit your belly open and stuff you with rocks and straw. So really, there's, there isn't really a Santa anywhere in the world that American Santa wouldn't lose to horribly in a cage match. <laughs> cage match Santa. <laughs> but I have discovered two of my newest, most favorite Christmas traditions. I'm going to share them with you right now. Okay. Christmas tradition one. Hot cockles. It's legit. It's an 18th century tradition. I'm going to guess it came out of Britain. Here's how you play. And if you guys want to play after the show, knock yourselves out. <laughs> Thank you. Here's how you play. You get a group of people together in one room. Okay. Blindfold one of them. Give another one a stick. The person with the stick hits the blindfolded guy. Then they put the stick away, take the blindfold off. Blindfold guy has to guess, who hit me? <laughs> Hot cockles. Next. Oh, man, that game goes on until everyone's really sore. I think that's the game where you talk someone into playing and then you quit. You know, it's like the game of who can punch who in the balls harder. Yeah, if you get talked into going first, you've already lost. Next and most favorite holiday tradition comes from Catalonia in Spain, and it is known as cagatillo, or literally translated, shit log. So here is my uh, Catalonian shit log, and it has a traditional song that goes along with it, where people uh, stand around the Christmas shit log and they beat it with sticks while encouraging it to poop presents. <laughs> and I am going to ask that we all stand to sing this song in a moment, but I'd like to explain that I had to, I had to uh, modernize and contemporize the lyrics because literally translated, the lyrics are shit log, shit candy, hazelnuts and cottage cheese. If you don't shit well, I'll beat you with a stick. Shit log. And, <laughs> I was having trouble. I tried row, row, row your boat, but it didn't work. So anyway, so I wrote a version that we are all going to be able to sing along. And uh, before we get there, could I, I have my two volunteers up here. And also, while my volunteers are coming up here, you all received presents this evening, courtesy of Noel and myself. And one of the nice things about present giving is you get to set the terms, and the terms were you couldn't open till I said. So now would you please all open the gifts you have borne so faithfully Lo, these many minutes, you have each received your very own holy nut for the evening. Is there someone in the room whose nut is already cracked and open? Yes, Diana, your nut is empty, and empty nuts are the holiest. Please approach the stage. A round of applause for our volunteers. Hello. Hello. It's Danielle. Yep. Hi, how are you? Great. And? I'm Mark. Hello, Mark. And? Deanna. Hello. Okay, so here, 
Diana, since uh, you received the holiest of nut, you get the most traditional log beating stick. Uh, Mark, there you go. We are going to sing this song, and we are going to sing it to the tune of You Are My Sunshine, which, which I will be playing at the piano. All right, ladies and gentlemen, while we sing, you will strike the poop log ceremonially with the beating sticks. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is in the key of G major. After me. You are my poop log, my Christmas poop log. You jump out presents on Christ's birthday. If you don't poop shit, I'll beat you senseless. And uh, Excellent! We're going to do it one more time! This time! That's all right, that's fine. We're going to sing this one more time, and instead of pony, I want you to think of the thing that you want the most this Christmas season. Hold it close to your heart, and you will be able to ask Cockatillo for this one most magical thing. As we run through the refrain, for our final time, are you prepared, ceremonial beaters? Here we go. You are my poop log, my Christmas poop log. You poop out presents on Christ's birthday. If you don't poop shit, I'll beat you senseless. Please poop us. Good, good, good. Today. That was awesome. And now we reveal Cagatillo's treasure trove. Oh look, somebody won a tangerine. Somebody won some, somebody got some dental floss. And for the holiest of nuts, you have won Cagatillo himself. That was a treasure to be remembered always. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. This has been funny about that holy nut. I'm Phil Van Hest, and we'll be back in the new year. I hope you will be too. Good night.